restored, renewed, one of 500 Buddhas returns to its place on the terraces that drape the hill. Silence and stillness. Noise and movement. Silence and stillness again. A journey through time lasting more than a thousand years. Borobudur was built three centuries before Angkor Wat and four centuries before the great Gothic cathedrals of Europe. Set in the rich green landscape of central Java in Indonesia, Borobudur is a monument of Mahayana Buddhism. Rising to a height of 30 meters, the terraced pyramid is crowned by a sealed and void central stupa. The sides of the square base are 123 meters long. The lower rectangular terraces, bordered by balustrades, carry altogether three kilometers of walls, decorated with 1,460 panels of finely carved reliefs, each telling a story in stone. The first panels depict scenes from the life of the Buddha of history, from the time of his birth until, at Benares, he proclaimed a new faith. The pilgrim enters by the east gate, turns to his left, and mounts terrace after terrace, keeping the monument always on his right, following the reliefs in sequence. Son of King Sododana and Queen Mahamaya, the Prince Siddhartha, as he was called, was born into the ruling family of a small Himalayan kingdom during the 6th century BC. Prince Siddhartha grew up in great luxury and in due course took for his wife a princess who bore him a son. At the age of 29, Siddhartha renounced his riches, left his family and began a life of meditation as a wandering monk. Many temptations and tribulations beset him during his search for truth. Overcoming them all, Siddhartha at last reached Benares, where, as the Buddha, the Enlightened One, he preached his first sermon on what he had learned. Four meetings, or signs, are said to have played a decisive role in the future Buddha's destiny. Wandering outside the palace grounds, he first met an aged man, leaning on his staff. A long life, he learned, must end in old age. Siddhartha then encountered a person who was very ill. Everybody, he learned, is subject to sickness. Siddhartha's third meeting was with a corpse. Death 
he learned, was the lot of all men. Finally, Siddhartha saw a holy man, a beggar, whose peaceful and serene expression was in contrast with the misery around him. Siddhartha knew then that he too must leave the gracious life into which he had been born and seek a solution to the problem of suffering. One night he slipped out of the palace. With this great departure, as it is known in Buddhist law, Siddhartha fulfilled his destiny. More than 50 years of wandering, teaching and meditation lay ahead on the path to vision, knowledge, calmness and awakening. Buildings suffer with the passage of time and Borobudur is no exception. Lichens and moss cover the stones, disfiguring the graceful sculptures. Tropical vegetation pushes the blocks apart. The statues weep. The monsoon rains overflow from the gargoyles. Water collects in puddles on the terraces and seeps through cracks to undermine the monument's foundations of soil and rubble. Earthquakes have shaken the hill of Borobudur. The building blocks of porous volcanic rock were assembled without mortar. Now they are like loose teeth. The walls of the lower terraces lean at crazy angles, barely supporting the great weight of the structure above. When, in 1948, the newly independent Republic of Indonesia assumed the enormous task of saving Borobudur, the condition of the monument was critical. Subsidence had already lowered its height by three meters. Gravity, the force which had first held the stones together, had begun to pull them down the slopes of the hill. Indonesia, the world's largest archipelago, with a population of 150 million. Most Indonesians are Muslims, but there are also Hindu, Christian and Buddhist communities. Borobudur is situated on the main island Java, a thousand kilometers of tropical forest and volcanic mountain ranges. Indonesia, as a newly independent state, did not have the means of saving Borobudur on its own. In 1973, the government signed an agreement with UNESCO to mount a large-scale rescue operation involving the dismantling and reconstruction of the most seriously threatened lower terraces. The present restoration work is concentrated or is only engaging this central part, that means the Rupa Gatu, which is actually that part full of reliefs. At present, we have finished the northern and the southern part of the monument. 
whereas the western and the eastern part are also for a good deal reconstructed. Forthcoming six months will be spent for the final stage of the reconstruction of the restoration and that means that we still have to reconstruct several parts of the balustrades and also the floors. The great task had actually begun as long ago as 1953. Under the supervision of Indonesian and foreign specialists, the first terraces were carefully dismantled. Carrying the blocks on bamboo poles, the Indonesian workmen repeated in the opposite direction, statue by statue, stone by stone, the gestures and movements of the original builders of Borobudur a thousand years ago. With the help of the international campaign, more modern techniques were introduced. The basic material in which the monument was constructed is andesite, a pale volcanic rock, porous and rough surfaced. Cut into regular shapes, the terrace blocks were fitted together without mortar, using double dovetail or interlocking joints. Each block was numbered and carefully listed for reference, and a computer kept track of all the operations. The numbered stones were then stored on pallets to await their return. More than 300,000 paving blocks, as well as 580 sculptures and carved panels, were removed from the monument and stocked at the foot of the hill. On the whole, the various elements were remarkably well preserved. The puzzle had slipped, but the pieces were still intact. UNESCO had by that time received payments and pledges worth more than $2 million from governments, private bodies and institutions, and from individual men, women and children who cared about Borobudur. The work of reconstruction was well underway. March 1976 was a historic date in the operation. Work began on the new reinforced concrete foundations of the monument. Water had been responsible for much of the decay of Borobudur. Ironically, it proved difficult to obtain enough water of the right quality to make the concrete for the new foundations and to clean the stones without bringing fresh microorganisms and pollution. Eventually, a suitable well was found in the neighborhood and the water was piped and pumped to the monument. A French microbiologist was sent by UNESCO to carry out, with her Indonesian colleagues, a thorough examination of the stones. For if the entire structure of Borobudur was falling apart, many of the stones themselves, especially those of the surface layers, were diseased and decayed. No stone was replaced before it had been examined, cleaned, and if necessary, treated. Here, at the first gallery, we can see the result of the restoration. Before the present restoration, the stones have been profusely ground by lichens, algae, mosses, and microbacteria. Uh, when we dismantled the stones uh, to be transported to the workshop, the stones were treated uh, chemically as well as manually to eliminate the growth of the microorganism. Each stone has the relief which represents uh, Prince uh, Siddhartha Gautama offering his rings to Yasudhara has been treated averagely one month. We have uh, about uh, more than 2,000 panels of the relief of the whole monument. In the huge workshop area, the stones were given a thorough scrubbing. Face packs of clay and chemicals were applied.
Herbicide sprays were used to discourage fresh growth. And then the stones were ready to be set back in place. When today's visitors, like the pilgrims of the past, make their way upwards and along the terraces, the significance of the effort to save Borobudur becomes clearer with every step. Rightly a source of national pride, the monument is clearly a world masterpiece of architecture and sculpture. Comparison of treated with untreated surfaces reveals what might have been lost. The massive, monstrous gargoyles are very interesting as works of art, but as part of the original system of drainage, they have proved less than efficient. New methods have been devised to carry away the runoff from the torrential rains. In the present restoration, we installed the drainage system uh, to facilitate the flowing of the water. So we can see that we improve the concrete slab to collect the rainwater and to make the channel and the, the water will be go down through the drainage pipes to the uh, down of the monument. During the early stages of the UNESCO sponsored project in 1972, an international consultative committee was set up to assist the Indonesian authorities in its implementation. One of the committee's members from Japan talks about the problem of the north side of the monument. Here, where I'm standing, is the northwest corner of the first lower terrace of Borobudur. By the beginning of the 1960s, the monument, composed of stone blocks built on an earth foundation, had greatly subsided as a result of rainwater infiltration from the surface, and this wall was leaning dangerously. This floor here was at a much lower level, at the level of the line you can see here. It had been realized by then that unless steps were taken to repair the decay, the monument of Borobudur was in danger of disappearing from the face of the earth. It has taken over 10 years and the efforts of hundreds of workmen and technicians to complete the restoration of Borobudur. The project will have cost more than $20 million, $6,600,000 contributed by UNESCO's member states and private sources, with the government of Indonesia bearing the greater part of the burden. One of the mysteries of Borobudur is the so-called hidden base. When it began to be excavated in the late 19th century, the base of the pyramid was found to be decorated with 160 carved reliefs, portraying worldly pleasures, and said by some to have been deliberately hidden from the eyes of pilgrims. More likely is that this was an early attempt to stop the building from sliding down the hill. If the base of the pyramid represents the sphere of desire, and the middle rectangular levels, the sphere of form, the three circular terraces at its summit represent the sphere of formlessness. 72 stupas echo the characteristic bell-shaped structure of the central dome. Each contains a statue of the Buddha, contemplating the empty sky through dozens of little diamond-shaped windows. At the beginning of the present century, this part of the monument was scarcely more than an untidy pile of stones. An Englishman, Sir Thomas Stamford Raffles, had explored the ruins thoroughly a hundred years before that, and Borobudur had been studied from many angles. But the first major restoration was carried out by a Dutch engineer, Theodore van Erp, between 1907 and 1911. Under Van Erp's direction, the crumbling stupas were rebuilt, 
Pavements were laid on the terraces and the carvings cleaned of lichens and moss. In 1973, the stonework of the upper circular terraces was cleaned without being dismantled, dry brushed and scrubbed with water. Each stupa and its Buddha, as well as the central dome and pinnacle, were treated to prevent a fresh growth of moss. This part of the building remained open to visitors throughout the restoration. Of the 504 statues originally identified at Borobudur, 43 have disappeared, 273 are damaged or have lost their heads, and more than 50 heads are still looking for their body. So we have the 58 Buddha heads, but we don't know the exact place on the body of Buddha. So the method of the measurement of the broken surface, we have the two types of measurement, one by the traditional, that means with the testing of the broken surface, and so we carry out by the man and fit uh, Buddha by Buddha. Matching by hand is obviously a lengthy and tiring process when so many possible combinations are involved. As the project to save Borobudu progressed, the computer had proved to be an indispensable tool. It was necessary to record and keep on file an enormous amount of information concerning dismantling and rebuilding operations, treatment, storage, pallet movements and scores of other jobs. More than one million items were removed and later returned to their original place on the monument. Komputer telah dipakai untuk membantu restorasi dari Candi Borobudur. Salah satu program yang dibuat adalah One of the programs which has been prepared involves the cataloging of significant stones. In this way they can be returned later to their places. Another program was to list missing stones. Why not write yet another program, the analysts asked, to match the heads without bodies with the bodies without heads. The technique itself was very simple. Since the break between the body and the head was invariably circular in shape, all that was necessary was to measure each break on the bodies and heads at regular intervals and to feed this information into the computer. Electronics did the rest. How the computer came to be involved in the first place is itself an interesting story. He was born close to Borobudur, and when he was a child, he enjoyed playing around the temple, especially during the holidays. When he visited the site again in 1972, he was distressed to see the state into which it had fallen. By that time, he had become a computer specialist. He had first-hand knowledge of the immense resources of electronic data processing. Why not use these resources to help save Borobudur? IBM berbuat sesuatu yang positif untuk membantu menyelamatkan candi Buddha yang paling besar di seluruh dunia sekarang ini. And that was where a new chapter of the story began. Help from many distant sources has been a key component in the restoration of Borobudur, but the work has made it possible to reciprocate this gesture. Archaeologists, architects and students from all over the world have learned much from their participation in this adventure. A little to the east of Borobudur, two neighbouring temples doubtless shared the history of the great monument. According to local legend, they were once linked by a ceremonial pathway paved with stone. Pawan, the closest to Borobudur, is one of the jewels of Javanese architecture, its lines enhanced by the absence of statues. Mandut, 
is larger and far more ornate. Its carved reliefs include a rare representation of a female bodhisattva. Most impressive in the half-light of the interior are three massive statues. One portrays the Buddha in the attitude of his first sermon. Mendut and Pawan were stages on the pilgrim's way before the long climb to the summit of Borobudur, the sphere of formlessness, symbol of nirvana, the goal of every Buddhist. Today, Borobudur has become one of Southeast Asia's major tourist attractions, with more than 300,000 visitors each year. With the fabric of the monument restored, the preservation of its essentially peaceful atmosphere and environment constitutes the final part of the project. We are now taking steps to ensure that visitors to Borobudur, and foreign tourists in particular, will be able to appreciate not only its many details, but also the site as a whole. By 1985, an area of 85 hectares surrounding the monument, including a museum and a study centre, would have been created to widen the points of interest for many of the visitors. With the restoration completed, it is time to begin thinking about conservation. It is in this framework that the immediate follow-up of our present restoration work will be the reconstruction of an archaeological park around this entire monument. So the area with a radius of 250 meters from the center of the monument will be the sanctuary area, that is the area where no buildings will be allowed. More than 1100 years ago, under the ruling Silendra dynasty, anonymous craftsmen and artists translated into stone the symbols of the faith of the time. For the following two centuries, Borobudur flourished as a center of pilgrimage, as the rulers and their builders had intended. Then the center of Java's political and cultural life shifted eastwards. Borobudur slipped under the surface of history, lost in time. Today, anchored to the earth, its summit in the wide sky's emptiness, Borobudur has re-emerged, protected, restored, preserved, beyond the reach of time. Mm -hmm.